Section 29 of The Arabian Nights Entertainment, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zappo. The Arabian Nights Entertainment, Volume 1, by Anonymous. Translated by Dr. Jonathan Scott. Section 29. The story of Nur ad-Din Ali and Budir ad-Din Husun. Commander of the Faithful. There was formerly a Sultan of Egypt, a strict observer of justice, gracious, merciful and liberal, and his valour made him terrible to his neighbours. He loved the poor, and protected the learned, whom he advanced to the highest dignities. This sultan had a vizier, who was prudent, wise, sagacious, and well versed in all sciences. This minister had two sons, who in everything followed his footsteps. The eldest was called Shumse ad-Din Mahmud, and the younger Nur ad-Din Ali. The latter was endowed with all the good qualities that man could possess. The vizier, their father, being dead, the sultan caused them both to put on the robes of a vizier. I am as sorry, said he, as you are for the loss of your father, and because I know you live together and love one another cordially, I will bestow his dignity upon you conjointly. Go and imitate your father's conduct. The two new viziers humbly thanked the sultan and retired to make due preparation for their father's interment. They did not go abroad for a month, after which they repaired to court, and attended their duties. When the sultan hunted, one of the brothers accompanied him, and this honour they had by turns. One evening, as they were conversing together after a cheerful meal, the next day being the elder brother's turn to hunt with the sultan, he said to his younger brother, Since neither of us is yet married, and we live so affectionately together. Let us both wed the same day, sisters out of some family that may suit our quality. What do you think of this plan? Brother, answered the other vizier, there cannot be a better thought. For my part, I will agree to anything you approve. But this is not all, said the elder. My fancy carries me farther. Suppose both our wives should conceive the first night of our marriage, and should happen to be brought to bed on one day, yours of a son and mine of a daughter, we will give them to each other in marriage. Nay, said Nur ad-Din aloud, I must acknowledge that this prospect is admirable. Such a marriage will perfect our union and I willingly consent to it. But then, brother, said he, father, if this marriage should happen, would you expect that my son should settle a jointure on your daughter? There is no difficulty in that, replied the other, for I am persuaded that, besides the usual articles of the marriage contract, you will not fail to promise in his name at least three thousand sequins, three landed estates, and three slaves. <laughs> no, said the younger, I will not consent to that. Are we not brethren and equal in title and dignity? Do not you and I know what is just? The male being nobler than the female, it is your part to give a large dowry with your daughter. By what I perceive, you are a man that would have your business done at another's charge. Although Nur ad-Din spoke these words in jest, 
His brother, being of a hasty temper, was offended, and falling into a passion, said, A mischief upon your son, since you prefer him before my daughter. I wonder you had so much confidence as to believe him worthy of her. You must needs have lost your judgment to think you are my equal, and say we are colleagues. I would have you to know that since you are so vain, I would not marry my daughter to your son, though you would give him more than you are worth. This pleasant quarrel between two brothers about the marriage of their children before they were born went so far that Shumsi ad Din concluded by threatening. Were I not to-morrow, said he, to attend the Sultan, I would treat you as you deserve. But at my return I will make you sensible that it does not become a younger brother to speak so insolently to his elder as you have done to me. Upon this he retired to his apartment in anger. Shumse ad Din, rising early next morning, attended the sultan, who went to hunt near the pyramids. As for Nur ad Din, he was very uneasy all night, and supposing it would not be possible to live longer with a brother who had treated him with so much haughtiness, he provided a stout mule, furnished himself with money and jewels, and, having told his people that he was going on a private journey for two or three days, departed. When out of Cairo, he rode by way of the desert towards Arabia, but his mule, happening to tire, was forced to continue his journey on foot. A courier, who was going to Bussara by good fortune overtaking him, took him up behind him. As soon as the courier reached that city, Nur ad-Din alighted, and returned him thanks for his kindness. As he went about to seek for a lodging, he saw a person of quality with a numerous retinue, to whom all the people showed the greatest respect, and stood still till he had passed. This personage was Grand Vizier, to the Sultan of Bussorah, who was passing through the city to see that the inhabitants kept good order and discipline. This minister, casting his eyes by chance on Nur ad-Din Ali, perceiving something extraordinary in his aspect, looked very attentively upon him, and, as he saw him in a traveller's habit, stopped his train asked him who he was, and from whence he came. Sir, said Nur ad-Din, I am an Egyptian, born at Cairo, and have left my country because of the unkindness of a near relation. Resolved to travel through the world, and rather to die than return home. The Grand Vizier, who was a good-natured man, after hearing these words, said to him, Son, beware, do not pursue your design. You are not sensible of the hardships you must endure. Follow me, I may perhaps make you forget the misfortunes which have forced you to leave your own country. Nur ad-Din followed the Grand Vizier, who soon discovered his good qualities and conceived for him so great an affection that one day he said to him in private, My son, I am, as you see, so far gone in years that it is not probable I shall live much longer. Heaven has bestowed on me only one daughter who is as beautiful as you are handsome and now fit for marriage. Several nobles of the highest rank at this court have sought her for their sons, but I would not grant their request. I have an affection for you, and think you so worthy to be received into my family, that, preferring you before all those who have demanded her, I am ready to accept you for my son-in-law. 
If you like the proposal, I will acquaint the Sultan, my master, that I have adopted you by this marriage, and entreat him to grant you the reversion of my dignity of Grand Vizier in the kingdom of Busra. In the meantime, nothing being more requisite for me than ease in my old age, I will not only put you in possession of great part of my estate, but leave the administration of public affairs to your management. When the Grand Vizier had concluded this kind and generous proposal, Nur ad-Din fell at his feet, and expressing himself in terms that demonstrated his joy and gratitude, assured him that he was at his command in every way. Upon this, the vizier sent for his chief domestics, ordered them to adorn the great hall of his palace, and prepare a splendid feast. He afterwards sent to invite the nobility of the court and city, to honour him with their company, and when they were all met, Nur ad-Din having made known his quality, he said to the noblemen present, for he thought it proper to speak thus on purpose, to satisfy those to whom he had refused his alliance, I am now, my lords, to discover a circumstance which hitherto I have kept a secret. I have a brother who is Grand Vizier to the Sultan of Egypt. This brother has but one son, whom he would not marry in the court of Egypt, but sent him hither to wed my daughter, in order that both branches of our family may be united. His son, whom I knew to be my nephew as soon as I saw him, is the young man I now present to you as my son-in-law. I hope you will do me the honour to be present at his wedding, which I am resolved to celebrate this day. The nobleman, who could not be offended at his preferring his nephew to the great matches that had been proposed, allowed that he had very good reason for his choice, were willing to be witnesses to the ceremony, and wished that God might prolong his days to enjoy the satisfaction of the happy match. The lords met at the vizier of Busora's palace, having testified their satisfaction at the marriage of his daughter with Nur ad-Din Ali, sat down to a magnificent repast, after which notaries came in with the marriage contract, and the chief lords signed it. And when the company had departed, the grand vizier ordered his servants to have everything in readiness for Nur ad-Din Ali to bathe. He had fine new linen, and rich vestments provided for him in the greatest profusion. Having bathed and dressed, he was perfumed with the most odoriferous essences, and went to compliment the vizier, his father-in-law, who was exceedingly pleased with his noble demeanour. Having made him sit down, My son, said he, you have declared to me who you are, and the office you held at the court of Egypt. You have also told me of a difference betwixt you and your brother, which occasioned you to leave your country. I desire you to make me your entire confidant, and to acquaint me with the cause of your quarrel, for now you have no reason either to doubt my affection, or to conceal anything from me. Nur ad-Din informed him of every circumstance of the quarrel, at which the vizier burst out into a fit of laughter and said, This is one of the strangest occurrences I ever heard. Is it possible, my son, that your quarrel should rise so high about an imaginary marriage? I am sorry you fell out with your elder brother upon such a frivolous matter. But he was also wrong in being angry at what you only spoke in jest, and I ought to thank heaven for that difference which has procured me such a son-in-law. But, continued the vizier, it is late and time for you to retire. Go to your bride, my son, she expects you. 
Tomorrow I will present you to the Sultan, and hope he will receive you in such a manner as shall satisfy us both. Nur ad-Din Ali took leave of his father-in-law and retired to his bridal apartment. It is remarkable that Shumse ad-Din Mahmud happened also to marry at Cairo the very same day that this marriage was solemnized at Bussorah, the particulars of which are as follow. After Nur ad-Din Ali left Cairo, with an intention never to return, his elder brother, who was hunting with the Sultan of Egypt, was absent for a month, for the Sultan, being fond of the chase, continued it often for so long a period. At his return, Shumse ad-Din was much surprised when he understood that under pretense of taking a short journey, his brother departed from Cairo on a mule the same day as the Sultan, and had never appeared since. It vexed him so much the more, because he did not doubt but the harsh words he had used had occasioned his flight. He sent a messenger in search of him, who went to Damascus and as far as Aleppo, but Nur ad-Din was then at Bussora. When the courier returned and brought no news of him, Shumse ad-Din intended to make further inquiry after him in other parts, but in the meantime matched with the daughter of one of the greatest lords in Cairo, upon the same day in which his brother married the daughter of the Grand Vizier of Bussorah. At the end of nine months, the wife of Shumse ad-Din was brought to bed of a daughter at Cairo, and on the same day the lady of Nur ad-Din was delivered of a son at Busura, who was called Budir ad-Din Husun. The Grand Vizier of Busura testified his joy for the birth of his grandson by gifts and public entertainments and to show his son-in-law the great esteem he had for him, he went to the palace and most humbly besought the sultan to grant Nur ad-Din Ali his office, that he might have the comfort before his death to see his son-in-law made grand vizier in his stead. The sultan, who had conceived a distinguished regard for Nur ad-Din when the vizier had presented him upon his marriage, and had ever since heard everybody speak well of him, readily granted his father-in-law's request, and caused Nur ad-Din immediately to be invested with the robe and insignia of the Vizarut, such as state drums, standards, and writing apparatus of gold, richly enamelled and set with jewels. The next day, when the father saw his son-in-law preside in council, as he himself had done, and perform all the offices of Grand Vizier, his joy was complete. Nur ad-Din Ali conducted himself with that dignity and propriety which showed him to have been used to state affairs, and engaged the approbation of the Sultan and reverence and affection of the people. The old Vizier of Bussorah died about four years afterwards, with great satisfaction seeing a branch of his family that promised so fair to support its future consequence and respectability. Nur ad-Din Ali performed his last duty to him with all possible love and gratitude, and as soon as his son Budir ad-Din Husun had attained the age of seven years, provided him an excellent tutor, who taught him such things as became his birth. The child had a ready wit and a genius capable of receiving all the good instructions that could be given. After Budir ad-Din had been two years under the tuition of his master, who taught him perfectly to read, he learnt the Qur'an by heart. His father put him afterwards to other tutors, by whom his mind was cultivated to such a degree that when he was twelve years of age he had no more occasion for them and then, as his physiognomy promised wonders, he was admired by all who saw him.
Hitherto his father had kept him to study, but now he introduced him to the sultan, who received him graciously. The people who saw him in the streets were charmed with his demeanour, and gave him a thousand blessings. His father, proposing to render him capable of supplying his place, accustomed him to business of the greatest moment, on purpose to qualify him betimes. In short, he omitted nothing to advance a son he loved so well. But as he began to enjoy the fruits of his labour, he was suddenly seized by a violent fit of sickness, and, finding himself past recovery, disposed himself to die a good Mussulman. In that last and precious moment, he forgot not his son, but called for him and said, My son, you see, this world is transitory. There is nothing durable but in that to which I shall speedily go. You must therefore from henceforth begin to fit yourself for this change, as I have done. You must prepare for it without murmuring so as to have no trouble of conscience for not having acted the part of a really honest man. As for your religion, you are sufficiently instructed in it, by what you have learned from your tutors and your own study, and as to what belongs to an upright man, I shall give you some instructions, of which I hope you will make good use. As it is a necessary thing to know oneself, and you cannot come to that knowledge without you first understand who I am, I shall now inform you. I am a native of Egypt. My father, your grandfather, was first minister to the sultan of that kingdom. I had myself the honour to be vizier to that sultan, and so has my brother, your uncle, who I suppose is yet alive. His name is Shumse ad-Din Mahmud. I was obliged to leave him and come into this country where I have raised myself to the high dignity I now enjoy. But you will understand all these matters more fully by a manuscript that I shall give you. At the same time, Nur ad-Din Ali gave to his son a memorandum book, saying, Take and read it at your leisure. You will find, among other things, the day of my marriage and that of your birth. These are circumstances which perhaps you may hereafter have occasion to know. Therefore you must keep it very carefully. Budir ad-Din Husun, being sincerely afflicted to see his father in this condition, and sensibly touched with his discourse, could not but weep when he received the memorandum book and promised at the same time never to part with it. That very moment Nur ad-Din fainted, so that it was thought he would have expired. But he came to himself again and spoke as follows. My son, the first instruction I give you is not to make yourself familiar with all sorts of people. The way to live happy is to keep your mind to yourself, and not to tell your thoughts too easily. Secondly, not to do violence to anybody whatever, for in that case you will draw everybody's hatred upon you. You ought to consider the world as a creditor to whom you owe moderation, compassion and forbearance. Thirdly, not to say a word when you are reproached, for, as the proverb says, he that keeps silence is out of danger. And in this case particularly, you ought to practice it. You also know what one of our poets says upon this subject, that silence is the ornament and safeguard of life, that our speech ought not to be like a storm of hail that spoils all. Never did any man yet repent of having spoken too little, whereas many have been sorry that they spoke so much. Fourthly, to drink no wine, 
for that is the source of all vices. Fifthly, to be frugal in your way of living. If you do not squander your estate, it will maintain you in time of necessity. I do not mean you should be either profuse or niggardly, for though you have little, if you husband it well and lay it out on proper occasions, you will have many friends. But if on the contrary you have great riches and make but a bad use of them, all the world will forsake you and leave you to yourself. In short, the virtuous Nur ad-Din continued till the last aspiration of his breath to give good advice to his son, and when he was dead, he was magnificently interred. Nur ad-Din was buried with all the honours due to his rank. Budir ad-Din Husun of Busura, for so he was called because born in that city, was with grief for the death of his father, that instead of a month's time to mourn, according to custom, he kept himself shut up in tears and solitude about two months, without seeing anybody, or so much as going abroad to pay his duty to his sovereign. The sultan, being displeased at his neglect, and looking upon it as a slight, suffered his passion to prevail, and in his anger, called for the new Grand Vizier, for he had created another on the death of Nur ad-Din, commanded him to go to the house of the deceased, and seize upon it with all his other houses, lands, and effects, without leaving anything for Budir ad-Din Husun, and to confine his person. The new Grand Vizier, accompanied by his officers, went immediately to execute his commission, but one of Budir ad-Din Husun's slaves, happening accidentally to come into the crowd, no sooner understood the vizier's errand that he ran before to give his master warning. He found him sitting in the vestibule of his house, as melancholy as if his father had been but newly dead. He fell down at his feet out of breath, and after he had kissed the hem of his garment, cried out, My lord, save yourself immediately. The unfortunate youth, lifting up his head, exclaimed, What news dost thou bring? My lord, said he, there is no time to be lost. The sultan is incensed against you, has sent to confiscate your estates and to seize your person. The words of this faithful and affectionate slave occasioned Budir ad-Din Husun great alarm. May not I have so much time, said he, as to take some money and jewels along with me? No, sir, replied the slave, the Grand Vizier will be here this moment. Be gone immediately, save yourself. The unhappy youth rose hastily from his sofa put his feet in his sandals, and after he had covered his head with the skirt of his vest, that his face might not be known, fled without knowing what way to go to avoid the impending danger. He ran without stopping till he came to the public burying ground, and as it was growing dark, resolved to pass that night in his father's tomb. It was a large edifice covered by a dome which Nur ad-Din Ali, as is common with the Muslims, had erected for his sepulture. On the way, Budir ad-Din met a Jew, who was a banker and merchant, and was returning from a place where his affairs had called him to the city. The Jew, knowing Budir ad-Din, stopped and saluted him very courteously. Isaac the Jew, after he had paid his respects to Budir ad-Din Husun by kissing his hand, said, My lord, dare I be so bold as to ask whither you are going at this time of night, alone and so much troubled? Has anything disquieted you? Yes, said Budir ad-Din. 
A while ago I was asleep, and my father appeared to me in a dream, looking very fiercely upon me, as if much displeased. I started out of my sleep in alarm, and came out immediately to go and pray upon his tomb. My lord, said the Jew, who did not know the true reason why Budir ad-Din had left the town, your father of happy memory, and my good lord, had store of merchandise in several vessels which are yet at sea and belong to you. I beg the favour of you to grant me the refusal of them before any other merchant. I am able to pay down ready money for all the goods that are in your ships. And, to begin, if you will give me those that happen to come in the first that arrives in safety, I will pay you down in part of payment a thousand sequins. And, drawing out a bag from under his vest, he showed it him sealed up with one seal. Budir ad-Din Husun, being banished from home and dispossessed of all that he had in the world, looked on this proposal of the Jew as a favour from heaven, and therefore accepted it with joy. My lord, said the Jew, then you sell me for a thousand sequins the lading of the first of your ships that shall arrive in port? Yes, answered Budir ad-Din, I sell it to you for a thousand sequins. It is done. Upon this the Jew delivered him the bag of a thousand sequins, and offered to count them, but Budir ad-Din said he would trust his word. Since it is so, my lord, said he, be pleased to favour me with a small note of the bargain we have made. As he spoke, he pulled the inkhorn from his girdle, and, taking a small reed out of it neatly cut for writing, presented it to him with a piece of paper. Budir ad-Din Husun wrote these words. This writing is to testify that Budir ad-Din Husun of Bussorah has sold to Isaac the Jew for the sum of one thousand sequins received in hand the lading of the first of his ships that shall arrive in this port. This note he delivered to the Jew after having stamped it with his seal, and then took his leave of him. While Isaac pursued his journey to the city, Budir ad-Din made the best of his way to his father's tomb. When he came to it, he prostrated himself to the ground, and, with his eyes full of tears, deplored his miserable condition. Alas, said he, Unfortunate Budir ad-Din, what will become of thee? Whither canst thou fly for refuge against the unjust prince who persecutes thee? Was it not enough to be afflicted by the death of so dear a father? Must fortune needs add new misfortunes to just complaints? He continued a long time in this posture, but at last rose up, and, leaning his head upon his father's tombstone, his sorrows returned more violently than before, so that he sighed and mourned, till, overcome with heaviness, he sunk upon the floor and dropped asleep. He had not slept long, when a genie, who had retired to the cemetery during the day and was intending, according to his custom, to range about the world at night, entered the sepulchre, and, finding Budir ad-Din lying on his back, was surprised at his beauty. When the genie had attentively considered Budir ad-Din Husun, he said to himself, To judge of this creature by his beauty, he would seem to be an angel of the terrestrial paradise whom God has sent to put the world in a flame by his charms. At last, after he had satisfied himself with looking at him, he took a flight into the air where, meeting by chance with a peery, they saluted one another. 
after which he said to her, Pray descend with me into the cemetery where I dwell, and I will show you a beauty worthy of your admiration. The Piri consented, and both descended in an instant. They came into the tomb. Look, said the genie, showing her Budir ad-Din Husun. Did you ever see a youth more beautiful? The Piri, having attentively observed Budir ad-Din, replied, I must confess that he is a very handsome man, but I am just come from seeing an object at Cairo more admirable than this, and if you will hear me, I will relate her unhappy fate. You will very much oblige me, answered the genie. You must know, then, said the Piri, that the Sultan of Egypt has a vizier, Shumse ad-Din Mahmud, who has a daughter most beautiful and accomplished. The sultan, having heard of this young lady's beauty, sent the other day for her father and said, I understand you have a daughter to marry. I would have her for my bride. Will not you consent? The vizier, who did not expect this proposal, was troubled and instead of accepting it joyfully, which another in his place would certainly have done, he answered the sultan, May it please your majesty, I am not worthy of the honour you would confer upon me, and I most humbly beseech you to pardon me if I do not accede to your request. You know I had a brother, who had the honour as well as myself, to be one of your viziers. We had some difference together, which was the cause of his leaving me suddenly. Since that time I have had no account of him, till within these four days, that I heard he died at Bussorah, being grand vizier to the sultan of that kingdom. He has left a son, and there having been an agreement between us to match our children together, I am persuaded he intended that match when he died, and being desirous to fulfil the promise on my part, I conjure your majesty to grant me permission. The Sultan of Egypt, provoked at this denial of his vizier, said to him in anger which he could not restrain, is this the way in which you requite my condescension in stooping so low as to desire your alliance? I know how to revenge your presumption in daring to prefer another to me, and I swear that your daughter shall be married to the most contemptible and ugly of my slaves. Having thus spoken, he angrily commanded the vizier to quit his presence. The vizier retired to his palace, full of confusion and overwhelmed in despair. This very day the sultan sent for one of his grooms, who is humpbacked, big-bellied, crook-legged, and as ugly as a hobgoblin and after having commanded the vizier to marry his daughter to this ghastly slave, he caused the contract to be made and signed by witnesses in his own presence. The preparations for this fantastical wedding are all ready, and this very moment all the slaves belonging to the lords of the court of Egypt are waiting at the door of a bath, each with a flambeau in his hand for the crook-back groom, who is bathing, to go along with them to his bride, who is already dressed to receive him. And when I departed from Cairo, the ladies met for that purpose, were going to conduct her in her nuptial attire to the hall where she is to receive her hump-backed bridegroom, and is this minute expecting him. I have seen her, and do assure you that no person can behold her without admiration. 
When the Peri left off speaking, the genie said to her, Whatever you think or say, I cannot be persuaded that the girl's beauty exceeds that of this young man. I will not dispute it with you, answered the Peri, for I must confess, he deserves to be married to that charming creature whom they design for humpback and I think it were a deed worthy of us to obstruct the sultan of Egypt's injustice and put this young gentleman in the room of the slave. You are in the right, answered the genie. I am extremely obliged to you for so good a thought. Let us deceive him. I consent to your revenge upon the Sultan of Egypt. Let us comfort a distressed father, and make his daughter as happy as she thinks herself miserable. I will do my utmost endeavours to make this project succeed, and I am persuaded you will not be backward. I will be at the pains to carry him to Cairo before he awakes and afterwards leave it to your care to carry him elsewhere when we have accomplished our design. The Peri and the Genie, having thus concerted what they had to do, the Genie lifted up Budir ad-Din Husun gently, and with an inconceivable swiftness conveyed him through the air and set him down at the door of a building next to the bath, whence humpback was to come with a train of slaves that waited for him. Budir ad-Din awoke, and was naturally alarmed at finding himself in the middle of a city he knew not. He was going to cry out, but the genie touched him gently on the shoulder, and forbade him to speak. He then put a torch in his hand, saying, Go and mix with the crowd at the door of the bath, Follow them till you come into a hall where they are going to celebrate a marriage. The bridegroom is a humpbacked fellow, and by that you will easily know him. Put yourself at the right hand as you go in. Open the purse of sequins you have in your bosom. Distribute them among the musicians and dancers as they go along. And when you are got into the hall, Give money also to the female slaves you see about the bride. But every time you put your hand in your purse, be sure to take out a whole handful, and do not spare them. Observe to do everything exactly as I have desired you. Be not afraid of any person, and leave the rest to a superior power who will order matters as he thinks fit. Budir ad-Din, being well instructed in all that he was to do, advanced towards the door of the bath. The first thing he did was to light his torch at that of a slave, and then, mixing among them as if he belonged to some noblemen of Cairo, he marched along as they did, and followed Humpback, who came out of the bath and mounted a horse from the sultan's own stable. Budir ad-Din coming near to the musicians and men and women dancers, who went just before the bridegroom, pulled out time after time whole handfuls of sequins, which he distributed among them, and as he thus gave his money with an unparalleled grace and engaging mien, all who received it fixed their eyes upon him, and after they had a full view of his face, they found him so handsome that they could not withdraw their attention. End of section twenty nine. Recording by Zappo.